Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 20th, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly on Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and on my website at bgkeithley.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss whether the Alaska legislature is likely to approve a full PFD, and if so, where do things go from there? Second, we discuss how deep vetoes should go this year. Some suggest just deep enough to set spending reductions on a glide path. Others argue for tearing off the Band-Aid. And third, we agree with Jim Crawford that yes, the state has other fiscal reserves, but we disagree on whether they should be spent now. And now, let's join Michael. The weekly top three this week kicks things off and we start to talk about, uh, you know, first things first, the dividend that is going to, I mean, that is the 11 billion pound elephant in the room. Uh, And so number one, will the legislature approve a full PFD? And if so, what will, uh, what will it cost us? What will it cost us when it's all said and done? Well, to take the first question first, I, I, I'm, I'm becoming a believer that, uh, that Governor Dunleavy is, in fact, going to veto any budget that's sent to him uh, that doesn't have a full PFD. And the, from the sounds of it, it's not going to be a line item veto. It's just going to be sort of a, a basic premise. You didn't send me one with the full PFD veto. Try again. Uh, the question has always been, does he have 16 in the legislature to uphold that veto? Because the process will be legislature will send him a budget that doesn't have the full PFD. The governor vetoes it, sends it back, uh, and then the effort, an effort will be made to try to override uh, that veto and, and, and you know, approve a, a budget that doesn't have the full PFD. And the question will be, does he have 16 in the, in the, in the legislature to, uh, to uphold that sort, of, that sort of resolution or that sort of position? And, you know, if you, from, from listing to Senator Machicki, uh, who in the past few days has said we're going to have a three thousand dollar PFD? If the legislature doesn't realize that now, they're going to realize it by June thirtieth. Senator Shower yesterday on the on the program. Um, I'm I'm becoming convinced that at least there are people down in Juneau who truly believe they're going to have sixteen to uphold that veto, uh, which is the key to upholding the three thousand dollar PFD. So, the the answer to the first question seems it increasingly seems like yes, we are. Uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure uh, brought to bear on on the 16 or 17 or 18 or 20 or however many there are that are going to be uh, lined up to vote for this. And hopefully the administration is keeping a, keeping, doing a good job of keeping tabs on them and making sure uh, that they're staying on board. Uh, but, but right now it looks like uh, there, there are many who believe that there's going to be 16 down there to uphold that veto and, and, and essentially force the legislature to keep going back. Uh, the message will be you keep going back until you get a $3,000 PFD. Now, do you agree with my analysis earlier when I said, you know, we've got people like Kathy Giesel who have said, um, you know, uh, we we just can't continue. We just can't continue to, to do what we're doing and move forward. It's not sustainable. Uh, but I said the thing that she didn't say at this spending level. Um, I mean, do you think that that's accurate? Well, What's not sustainable, and and I and I think I think what you're saying is the same thing, maybe slightly different words than I use. What's not sustainable is the spending level we've got. It it I mean people want to try to. I put a couple of posts out in the last couple of days. If, if people haven't seen them yet, they may want to look at the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page as I try to articulate this. 
prior to 2017, prior to just two years ago, we viewed the PFD as as the first to pay. Right. It was the first dollars out the door. Uh, it was a given. It was designated general funds. The statute operated to uh, uh, put that money in uh, in citizens' hands, and then we dealt with the budget from from there on in. Now, uh, due to a change that was made in 2017 by uh, the Ledge Finance Division at the at the request of, of Senate leadership, Senate Finance leadership at the time, which was Pete Kelly and Anna McKinnon, both of whom are no longer in the legislature, um, the the the, the cha- a change was made to put the PFD, redesignate the PFD, recharacterize it as unrestricted general funds, and essentially move it from last to pay to first to cut. Um, and and when you hear Diesel and others say it's not sustainable, it's in the context now of the PFD supposedly, supposedly being the first to cut the shock absorber, the thing that the thing that that's left over at the end uh, to pay. That's that's not the way the statute reads. That's not the way it was interpreted from the early 1980s through two seven through 2017. Um, and it's not the way that that the one w- who normally reads statutes to mean something would would understand the PFD to, to be. So if we if we go back and we put the PFD back where it was up to 2017 as the first to pay, according consistent with the statute, then then what's really unsustainable uh, is what's been unsustainable since 2013 when we launched into these deficits. And that's our spending level. Right. Uh, it's unsustainable because we don't have revenues uh, sufficient to match with the spending uh, that we're undertaking. So K- Kathy Giesel <laughs> and others will use the word, Chris Birch, as you as you pointed out earlier, will use the word unsustainable when they're talking about the PFD. But that's not the way the statutes operate. And it's not the way we viewed things up to 2017. We do have an unsustainability problem. But that's that the problem is with the spending levels, not with the not with the PFT. Right, because if we do continue spending at the levels we're spending, then I mean, arguably, I guess you could say yes, we could deplete the permanent fund, the earnings reserve, and everything else. But if we lived within our means and treated the PFD as the first must pay, uh, as it was the shall transfer language, then it would be this would be you know that that argument would be a non-starter because what it would show and what it would highlight is that. We do not that we just cannot afford the 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 spending levels that we have right now. We we can't afford them at our at our current revenues. I mean, I think I think the discussion we need to get back to the discussion that frankly we should have had from 2013 forward, which is if we want to spend this much, we need to pay for it. It's like Congress, right? If you want to spend this much, you need to pay for it. You can't. I mean, we in, in the state we've just drained. What were what were significant reserves, uh, you know, roughly sixteen billion dollars in reserves. We've drained those down to support a spending habit uh, that that was that was unsustainable. Um, and if if we feel as a state we want to continue these spending levels, if all these people who turned out at the House Finance hearings out in in Anchorage and elsewhere, if if that's the will of the of the citizenry citizenry that that we need. These spending levels on education, on the you know, I'm, I'm gonna swallow my tongue when I say this, on the university, on 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 all of the various uh, things that we that we have as a state that we do as a state, then we need revenues. I mean, we've got it. We have to face up to the fact that that we need revenues to match them, and and those revenues come from taxes. I mean, the preference has been. The, the reason the switch was made in 2017 was to set the PFD up as the tax. Right. Cutting the PFD is the tax to fund these things. Uh, but if you if you if you look at the statute and you put the PFD back in the in the in the first uh, first uh, spend uh, column where the statute puts it, then you know, and we have unsustainable spending levels uh, from other things. We need we're going to need revenues. And the discussion we should be having is: Are Alaskans willing to stand up? and pay for all these things that we say we need out of government. And frankly, once I, I think, once we have start that discussion, are you willing? Are you Natasha Von Imhoff? Are you Chris Birch? Are you, <coughs> excuse me, all the top 20 percenters, are you willing to pay all these doctors that lectured the governor at one point? Are you willing to stand up and pay five uh, percent uh, of your of your adjusted gross income, which is basically what it would take on a flat tax, are you willing to pay that 
uh, in order to fund these spending levels. I think we're going to get into a discussion of, well, no, gosh, if I've got to spend that, if I've got to pay that out of my pocket, no, I'm not. I don't want those things. Yeah, we can get K through 12 under control. Yeah, we can get the university under control. And that's the discussion I think we need to move to. I think we need to confront those people who say that we that we need all the government services that we've got today. We need to confront them with, are you willing to pay for it? And it's going to be a 5% flat tax or whatever other tax anybody wants to come up with. But that's what it's going to be to pay for this stuff. And I think that's the way we'll get spending under control once people are confronted with the fact they have to pay for it. Wouldn't it, wouldn't that be turning their own argument on their head? I mean, really at this point, wouldn't, cause I mean, they've, they've always made the argument that it's a, it's a revenue problem, not a spending problem. But if we took the, if we took the offense and said, oh, okay, well, we'll just do that. Let's just have here. Let's just talk this tax. Let's just say, okay, it's going to be a four or 5% adjusted gross income tax, flat tax or whatever. You guys, if you're all about the spending, then you should be more than willing to pay for it um and and i mean and i think in the long run again just for clarification neither brad nor i are for taxation in that regard we could live within our means but since they don't seem to be listening to any other argument how about we take that and see what how about we take that and see what happens i I wrote an article a couple of years back now that i refer to that i still refer to often and it's the title of it is something along the lines of do you really want to get spending under control then a flat tax is the, way, is the way to do it. And and I truly, I think the disciplining effect of having, of, of confronting this, this, this sort of Damocles sitting over your head, if you, if you want to spend an additional dollar out of government, you're going to have to pay an additional proportionate share out of your pocket to do that. I, I think that will, uh, I think that will trigger, frankly, finally trigger the the, the 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 getting spending under control. As long as Natasha von Imhoff, as long as Chris Birch and the other top one, five, ten, twenty percenters, as long as they can shove the bulk of the funding issue off on middle and lower income Alaska families, like you do with PFD cuts, as long as they can do that, they're not going to talk about spending constraint. I mean, they're going to talk about it in the same sense that they're Republicans. Uh, they're going to say that they're in favor of spending cuts, but you know, cut K through 12. Now we really don't want to do that. Cut three universities down the one. Now we really don't want to do that. I mean, they're going to continue to go through and, 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 and say, yes, we want to cut, but we don't really want to cut that. Uh, as long as they, as long as they can shove the responsibility off on, on middle and lower income Alaska families. But the second they have to confront the second, the top 20%, the donor class, the ones that, that, that the bulk of our legislatures and legislators are in the top 20% and the bulk of the people they live to li- listen to, once they have to confront that they're going to have to pay out of their pocket the same percent of their income that they're trying to get, that they're trying to force off on middle and lower income Alaska families, once, they, once that gets in their head that they're going to have to pay that same percentage, then, then we're going to have a whole new conversation, in my opinion, we're going to have a whole new conversation about uh, about spending cuts, and I and I think that's the way we get to it. I think we've got. I think I think the way we get to it is to say, doctors. I mean, if, as you and I talked about a couple of weeks ago, if I were the governor and I had had these Medicaid Medicaid doctors, you know, confronting me about, oh, you can't cut Medicaid because uh, you know it's for the patients. It's really for their pocketbooks, but it's for the patients. I would have, if I'd been in that, in that situation, I would have said, fine. Are you ready to pay? 15% of your adjusted gross income, the same that you're trying to push off on middle and lower income Alaska families, are you ready to pay that out of your pocket to pay for that? And the, and the, and the deer in the headlights look that you would have gotten back from those doctors uh, would have been, would have been, you know, eye opening. It would have told you, no, no. Yeah. But gosh, if we got to pay it, oh, heck no, we don't want that. No. Now, as long as we can shove it off on middle and lower income families, heck yes. Yeah. Hell, it would be, give us more. Give us right. four universities. Heck, we're not educating enough people. Right. Uh, but the second, the second you push that into, the second you push that down into their pocketbook, we're going to have a whole different discussion. Don't tax you. Don't tax me. Tax the guy behind the tree. Right. I mean, that's that's what it's always it always seems to fall back on. Harold says Von Imhoff, Giesel, and Birch are all per PFD Raiders. Bill Walker, Pete Kelly, Anna McKinnon are all out. I think that was an indication, Brad, of how people are feeling about this. Quite honestly, and I think that's why those folks. One of the reasons why those folks didn't uh, uh, didn't uh, get get sent back to uh, Juno. Well, that's certainly the case with Walker and Kelly. Anna retired 
rather than confront Laura Reinbold in a, in a primary uh, in her district. And you can sort of say that's the same thing, but yeah, I, I think there's a, I think, I think there is, is a, a, <laughs> if, if you look at the polling, if you look at that, you compare, you know, the speeches that everybody gave when house finance had these local hearings with what the polling results are, there's a silent majority out there uh, that, that just wants their PFD. I mean, have an expectation that, that the PFD uh, will be paid and, and, and are looking for uh, uh, representatives, senators and representatives that will deliver on that. Certainly, you know, that happened. Peter Machecki got that, got that message when Ron Gillum ran against him. So, yeah, I think there's, I think, I think that's what people's expectations are. It, you know, we, we, we had that, we, we had that history up until 2017 when ledge finance made the change and said, Oh no, it's un, unrestricted general funds. Um, and I think people have come to come to expect that. So, and and to me, it's consistent with Hammond's vision for for creating the permanent fund and how the permanent fund uh, earnings were to be used. So it's perfectly perfectly logical to me that, that people have that expectation. Well, and I think uh, Harold has a point here when he says our mineral resources are are being stolen and used to build out a huge bloated government. That's been the problem. The problem has been the disconnect between the resource, uh, you know, payments, the royalties, and everything else. It's it. We never see it. I mean, it's kind of like withholding tax, which I find to be one of the most offensive things out there because it's money you never see, so you never really feel it unless you're analyzing your pay stub every time you you know you get your paycheck. You're never really seeing it, and you're like, oh, I don't, you know, okay, I, you just kind of out of sight, out of mind. If we saw that money first, it would be a whole different discussion. Yeah, I mean. Economists, it doesn't take an economist to tell you, but economists will tell you that that free goods, uh, people people don't ration free goods. People don't value free goods. They just, I mean, if it's free, they want more and more of it. And and up through up through 2016, uh, we basically had free goods in this state. I mean, government was a government was a free good. The university, yeah, you had to pay tuition, but but the, having the having the university there was a was a free good and heavily subsidized by state government three universities uh, was a was a free good Medicaid was a free good I mean K through 12 was a free good uh, you, you can go on down the list of everything that was a free good yeah people wanted more of it and and even in 2016 when we finally started charging for it through PFD taxes it was a tax paid largely by middle and lower income Alaska families nowhere else in the United States do we have that sort of system where we where we put the bulk of the tax on middle and lower income Alaska families but we did here um, and so to the top 20 percent, to the donor class, to the legislators themselves, most of whom are in the top 20 percent, government was still a free good because they had they had middle and lower income Alaska families paying for paying for the, the portion that, Alas that Alaskans had to pay for through PFD cuts. Right. It's only once you once you people once you get people to confront uh, the fact that government's not a free good that you have to pay for it. Do they finally start confronting? Oh well, they start. They finally start making choices. Let's see. Do I want that money, or do I want you know? Do I want another university, or do I right. want three universities, redundant universities, or fifty-four schools districts? You know, and and all this kind of stuff. I mean, that's the thing. It really clarifies the difference between the nice to haves and the must haves. And unfortunately, we've been living on the nice to have for a long time because, again, we don't see we don't see the money. And so, again, we still wander around spouting things like, you know, we don't pay any taxes in this state. We do pay it. We just don't see it. It's just like the withholding and everything else. Um, you, you, you had a listener who wrote a letter a couple of weeks ago who said, would, it, would, would one step be to have a Z, to pass a tax, but have it be a zero percent tax and sort of have it be a sword, literally a sword of Damocles sitting over everybody's head? Um, and, and so the discussion would be in the legislature, do you want this third university or do you want this second and third university or are you willing to pay a 3% tax uh, to fund that and, and other things in government? And, you know, having that sword, um, uh, Governor Hammond, you know, had this vision back when the PFD was created and the income tax was, was, was terminated. But having that sword of a, of a tax sitting over your head I could, a zero percent tax could be a very, a very good disciplining tool to get the to get the conversation going in the right direction. Yeah, no, absolutely. We've been talking about the weekly top three. We just went over the top one, which was, uh, you know, what 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 kind of PFD we're going to look at. 
Are we going to see it? And that leads us, of course, to the discussions of the veto. The governor's already said he's going to veto any bill that doesn't include a fully funded PFD in the uh, in the formula or in the uh, in the uh, uh, lines of the budget, uh, which leads us to the question of all these red pens flying around. Everything's going on. There was some sticker shock when the governor rolled out his budget. Uh, he could line item this down quite a bit, but how far does he go? So, Brad, does he try and do this all in one fell swoop? Do we do the glide path? Do we rip the bandaid off? What's the what's the what's your thoughts here? Well, there's there's really two schools of thought that are going on right now. One is uh, we need to do this gradually over the next three years. You know, pick a number. Some people say two. Some people say three. Some people even say five. Uh, but we need to do this gradually to sort of allow the state of Alaska to adjust uh, to a lower spending level, and that the governor uh, uh, should should moderate his red pen to sort of stair step us down uh, into a into a lower cost environment. There's there's another school uh, that frank that frankly I belong to, which says let's just rip the bandaid off um, and and take it down to whatever level we can get 16 in the legislature to vote to sustain, uh, to vote to uphold, uh, and 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 let's get this conversation uh, going because I think the next the the next phase of the conversation after that is okay, you want to put some back. Then we're going to have then we're going to have a tax. Right. Uh, we're going to start the conversation about a tax, and and it's a broad based tax, and the top twenty percent is going to pay it as well as everybody else, and that's the way I think we're finally going to find the balance between the government we want uh, and the government we're willing to pay for, which is which is the balance that we've never found. One of the reasons that I don't like this glide path discussion frankly, is I've heard it every year since 2013. Right. In the 2012 election, when the Republicans knocked out the, uh, the bipartisan majority uh, and the Republicans took power, uh, there was they listed three priorities that they were going to undertake, one related to the oil taxes at the time. Uh, but, but one of the top three was a sustainable budget. And what, and what the legislators, the senators said was we're going to get we're going to get spending down to to revenues. Um, and I, I think I related this story last week, but I'll do it again. I was asked to come down and talk to the, the new Senate majority at the time uh, and describe what the sustainable budget was and the steps we needed to take to go to a sustainable budget. And it was a fairly good conversation, some rough questions, but a fairly good conversation. And I'll, and I'll never forget, after everybody had left, I was sitting there with Charlie, Charlie Huggins, who was the Senate president at the time, and, and Charlie said, yeah, we're going to get this started. You know, it may take us three or four years to get it started, uh, but but we're going to get this started. And I'm scratching my head going, um, "You're gonna, we're going to take from savings, which is part of the sustainable budget, to have those to invest, to produce, produce income. We're going to take from savings and glide this over three or four years. Well, okay. But we never, we never did that. I mean, right. We never – if, right. If, if you if you track revenues and spending, revenues went down a heck of a lot faster faster than spending ever went down. Spending sort of glided, but it it it, it didn't it didn't glide in any way, shape, or form down to where revenues were going. Well, and this is again kind of that old saying of uh, past performance is indicative of future results. Every time somebody says, "Well, we may take three or four years to get there," all I can think of is, I mean, how many three or four year windows do you need? Because you've said this on and off for the last twenty five years. Oh, we couldn't do that all at once. We need to be gentle about it. And we saw what happened here just recently, where they started to go down. They made some cuts, and then last year they went up a half a billion dollars. So I mean, it just the, the track record on that is. Is not just poor; it's abysmal. And to say that, oh, absolutely. yeah, to say we're going to get there over the course of years, I mean, we just need to rip the bandaid off and get it done. Yeah, exactly right. I, the university, which is which is sort of my universal example for how how bad this situation is. The university was told in 2016, go to look at consolidation, start consolidating sports teams, start consolidating down to down to one institution. And, and what happened was the university said, yeah, we're going to study that. We're going to have a task force for that. And they sort of trolled it along for a year. And then, you know, it, it, sort, it was sort of like a, 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 a song, right? I mean, it sort of played out at the end, sort of faded out at the end. And you never heard of those studies again. Um, and, and so they just sort of, they sort of outlasted it. They just sort of waited out uh, what was supposed to be a, a glide path down to a smaller institution. And now – 
when we're talking again about consolidation of the of the university, we're getting the same thing. Oh, we're going to have a task force to do that. Right. We're going to start talking to the NCAA, and we're going to start thinking about how to do that. And I, and I, you know, I've just seen this movie before. I've seen it too many times. You're not going to do it. I know you're not going to do it. You know, I know you're not going to do it. Um, if we if we give you the rope to you know to try to troll it out, so just take the band aid and rip it off. And 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 the governor's got to act within the constraint of 16, right? It's got to be the governor and 16 legislators who will back up each of these line item vetoes because if he makes a veto at a level that he's not going to get 16 to vote to vote to uphold, uh, then it's sort of a, you know, a useless act. So it's got to be within the constraint of holding 16 together, 16 legislators together for, for each of these vetoes. But by gosh, I would sort of like what economists call a Dutch auction. I would go out there and I would find how much it's going to cost me to get that 16th legislator to, um, to uh, uh, what, what spending level they'll, you know, vote to uphold on. And, I, and I'll go right down to that level because this, we're never going to get this done if we don't, if we don't make these cuts. And then when people want to build it back up, have the discussion about, okay, you want it, you want more government, are you willing to pay for it? Are you the top 20% the donor class willing to pay for it? And only when they start saying, yeah, I'm willing to pay a 5% on my adjusted gross income or 4% or whatever the number is uh, to, to, to pay for whatever government they want. I'm willing to do that. Then can we start building it back up? Right. As long as they say, as long as the Chris Birches and the Natasha Von Himoffs say, oh, yeah, let's build it back up by you know, PFT cuts and push it off on the middle and lower income Alaska families. <laughs> that's that's not building it back up. That's just giving them more. That's giving right. the top 20 percent free government. And Harold just gave us our argument. Why do you guys hate students? I mean, why do you why do you hate kids? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, because that's what we would hear the minute we start talking about cutting into university or K through 12 is why do you hate children? Um, let's. I, well, yeah, you know, I, I, I mean, I want it's, children. It's why do the top 20 percent hate kids? Yeah. Why right. won't they pay their proportionate share? Ooh, for the kids? savage. OK, I got you. I got you. All right. Let's move on to the number three of the weekly top three. And this was an interesting piece. This was an opinion piece. It was in the ADN from Jim Crawford, where he talks about the net cash position of a lot of departments and municipalities and says, look, it's not as crisis ridden as you might think. And he goes through to list the cash position of many, many. Di- Some of these communities and municipalities have cash positions in the billions of dollars, many of them in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And yet it seems like, why are we crying poor mouth? Um, but you say that he makes some uh, he makes some wrong assumptions in his conclusion. What what's uh, what's the issue here? Well, I, I, I like I think Jim Crawford's done a great service by going through and, and identifying all of these pots of savings that are out there. Um, I, you know, a lot of people talk about those. They've never really d- taken the trouble to go through and identify them. Jim, Jim does a great job going out and identifying those pots. But here's the deal. We, we have we have from 2013 to the present day, we have slid along, not made the hard decisions, not cut government uh, uh, by relying on savings, draining down the first the statutory budget reserve until it's gone. Now draining the constitutional budget reserve down to it, down to where it's almost gone. And now what Jim's really implying is we got to we ought to go with these additional pots of money uh, and start draining them down. Uh, to support continued government spending until we finally have them drained out. I, again, I've seen this movie. I've seen this movie since 2013. And what happens if you if you re- if you rely on draining these pots of money in order to continue government spending? You keep getting government spending. You don't get government spending under control because you can always push the, the 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 problem to tomorrow. And what happens in the meantime? You're draining your savings. I mean, there's a reason we have the, the constitutional budget reserve, and it's to get us through bad times, just like we've just like we've got like we went through when oil prices dropped. There's a reason that municipalities have, well, maybe either, uh, other than the North Slope Borough, which seems to have an excessive amount of reserves. But there's a reason that we have that the municipalities have these reserves, and it's to get them through tough times. It's to act as a cushion. Uh, uh, in the event that there's some catastrophic loss in, in the communities. It's not there. None of these, I don't think, I mean, I went through Jim's list and I looked at them. None of these seem excessive compared to the amount of 
their operating budgets. They all seem to have the relatively reasonable reserves, except, again, with the exception of the North Slope Borough, but reasonably you know, uh, 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 appropriate levels of reserves relative to their operating budget so that if each of these municipalities had some sort of uh, uh, fiscal crisis, fiscal catastrophe, or operational catastrophe, um, an earthquake in their community, a fire in their community, something uh, uh, of that nature, they would have reserves to call on. Right. I don't think it's appropriate, just just like I don't think it was appropriate for us to drain the CBR the way we've drained it. Well, I don't, and, and, and just like I don't think it's appropriate to drain the earnings reserve. I think you, you've nailed it. I mean, this is the argument that I've had with Randy all these years is that if we keep giving them more money in whatever form, whether it's in a new revenue stream of taxation or whether it's giving them the, the tertiary nod to go ahead and tap into these reserve accounts or whatever, the, the there is no downward pressure. They'll just keep spending at the current levels, and I think that's the biggest problem. It, it is. I mean, that's that's the song and dance we've gotten. That's the song and dance we got in 2016 uh, uh, when when the pressure was on to uh, to make the cuts to the university. Well, yeah, we, we still got reserves. Let's let's study it for a while and see if it's the right thing to do, uh, and ride along on these reserves. And so the CBR, you know, went down another six billion dollars or so, uh, eight billion dollars over the over the interview over the intervening period. I mean, that's, that's what it, – it's good to know where all the reserves are. I think Jim Crawford did a great job, you know, telling us where all these reserves are. It's just the, the implication that now that we know where they are, let's go drain them, uh, that I think is I think is the problem. I, we, this state has ridden along on reserves long enough. It's time that we pay – this generation pay its own way and stop and stop borrowing. Yeah, no, absolutely. Quit kicking the can down the road because eventually you will run out of road or cans, one of the two. And that's when everything, I mean, it'll be much worse. If you don't, if you don't soften the blow, if you don't pull the parachute and do the soft landing, you're going to auger in and it will be painful for everybody involved. Unless of course you're retired and now moved out of the state of Alaska and you don't feel any of that pain, which of course we've seen some of that happen over the years as well. Um, anyway, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend, for coming on board and joining us today. We really appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.